on country. Um, we acknowledge the deep history of this place and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. We acknowledge that country is an interconnected set of relationships between people, places, kinship and stories. We acknowledge our Aboriginal people's custodianship of country that has kept alive these relationships between all living things for millennia. We also acknowledge the many different countries that you might be sitting on um, today and the cultures that you come from as well. We acknowledge fresh water, bitter water and salt water, all the waterways that bring us together today. So if we can really think deeply about that, the fact that we are all coming from watery places, even if we are from the driest places on earth, but at the moment, everybody seems to be, at least in Wollongong, in very, very muggy places. Uh, water is central to what we will be talking about today. Um, before we hear from the panel, um, just a few pieces of housekeeping. This session is about to be recorded by, uh, Michelle is gonna turn on the record button in a moment. If you don't wish to be seen, feel free, as I said, to turn off your camera or if you don't want to have your camera on, that's fine as well. I understand about eating and children and dogs and embarrassing backgrounds. Um, but it would be lovely to see you and make connections with you. Um, everybody's doing this already, but if you could just make sure that if you're not speaking, if you could mute your mic um, for the session. But we'd also would love to hear from you. So if you do have any questions that are coming up even through the discussions, pop them into the chat and we'll do our best to make sure that we get to those questions as we move along. So if something really jumps out at you, during the actual conversations um, that we're going to be presenting at the beginning of this um, um, seminar, um, please pop them in the chat and we'll have a look at them that way. All right, so today's session is fourth in the series of the Blue Future seminars. And our aim in, in a larger sense of these seminars is to share our research with you from Blue Futures and also to reflect on the ways in which our engagement with Aboriginal knowledges has changed our research practice. In today's session, you're gonna hear from researchers from the humanities, largely, um, mainly from the stream of Blue Futures called Anticipating and Imagining. The five speakers are Catherine Moyle, Agnieszka Golder, Joe Sterling, Freya Croft, and me, Joshua Lobb. Um, and I'm gonna do that weird thing where I'm awkwardly gonna be chairing myself in this space. The way in which today is gonna to run is that each of us will speak for 10 minutes-ish, about our own individual research projects or sometimes collaborative research projects. And then I'll aim to lead a conversation about how our, our research has been changed through working together and engaging with Aboriginal knowledges of country. So I'm gonna take my lead from Jade Kennedy who has chaired some beautiful sessions over the last couple of weeks. Um, and also the, the fact that we've been working with Jade in, in this way uh, for the last two years. I'm gonna begin by asking each of the panelists um, where they're from, um, and the, the where you're from can be geographic, professional, or even emotional. Uh, it can be from muggy if you want um, today. So uh, tell us where you're from and what you'll be talking about today. And I will start with Catherine. <clears throat> Yama, everyone. Um, my name is Catherine Moyle. Today, I'm feeling pretty good, a little bit stuffed because I had to scoff my food um, before coming in. Um, I'm sitting over here on the innovation campus and out the window I've got a view of Jira and just I know at the end of the hallways like rather Jira's at the end of the hallway but I'm looking up at Kembla or Jembla up there um so that's where I am today I'm going to pass over to Joe. Thanks Catherine where am I from currently I'm sitting on Ewan country up at Fitzroy Falls it's kind of a waterfall country up here, um, always very misty, um, lots of, yeah, lots of lyre birds, lots of beautiful birds up here. Um, I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of a river, river country kind of person um, from where I grew up and where I've tended to move to over the period of my life. So yeah, I'm up, I'm up, up on the escarpment today. I'll hand over to Freya. Lovely, thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Freya. Um, I'm currently in Tarawana, um, so not too far from the beach. Been lucky enough to have a nice swim down at Taraji this morning. Um, but um, I'm originally from Bathurst, so nowhere near the coast. Um, but for me, it's been a you know I've been in Wollongong for ten years, so I kind of like to think of myself as a bit more of a coasty now, but still have those strong ties to the country. Um, Sorry, that is dog. 
<laughs> Hello, dog. <laughs> um, and I will pass on to Agnieszka. Hi, everyone. I'm from Visual Arts at the University of Wollongong. And at the moment, I'm at the bottom of Mount Kira. And if I look to the right, I can see the five islands and the ocean as well. Um, but originally, I'm very much from a place that has a lot of rivers in it in southern Poland. Joshua. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm from patting a, a frantic dog down here uh, who has just come from uh, surgery. So she's a little bit um, needy, which is fine. She's going to do well. Um, I am originally like Freya from inland New South Wales and specifically from Bathurst and from drought. Um, and so water is a really kind of important thing to me. And I've always been drawn uh, down to, Wollong to, to, to the coast and the south coast in particular. And I am really lucky to have been dragged to this place or drawn to this place, um, which I'm at the base of Manusley and, uh, and the ocean every morning. Um, and you'll hear about my ocean experiences because that's all I ever talk about. Um, so today um, we are going to be hearing about some uh, specific projects that we're working on um, and also talking a little bit more generally about um, our own um, research practice and how it's been sh um, shaped. Um, Catherine uh, is, is an interesting um, colleague in, in Blue Futures because she's, she, she moves around in all sorts of spaces. And so today she's going to be talking about values and I think that she's going to be talking about that largely in the governing guiding stream, I think. Um, we'll see how it goes. You never know uh, what you'll get with me, Joshua. Yeah, that's yeah. great. That's what I love. <laughs> that's so, all right. right. I'll hand um, it to you. Thank you very much. So I think for today, and, and I'm old school, I tend not to go with slides and things like that. But I want to do something a little bit different. I want to show you why values and why and sort of set up the context really for this, um, this seminar. Okay. And I figure if I can't do it in this seminar in particular, um, then it's not going to work anywhere. So I want you all just to think for a moment of your place. We've all got one, you know, some of you, like Kerry there, I think's got, got her place as her background. Um, it might be the place that you're drawn to, the place on the beach where you stop, you know, and pause for a moment. The place on the escarpment as you're driving along, you know, back down from Sydney, one of them for me is, is just at the top of Bulli Pass and I look down and I see, I see the escarpment and I, in the context of the ocean as well, you know. We've all got a place like that. So if you can pause for a moment and just think of that place where you'd prefer to be today, after here of course, you know, I want you to think about what's there, what you see, what you feel, what you're hearing, and what you're smelling. And I want you to think for just a moment about what you're feeling internally. So what emotional response that's, that's eliciting for you and the why. So if you've got your cameras off, feel free to close your eyes. If you're game and you wanna close your eyes and you're on camera, that's okay too. But just really step back into that space for a moment and think about what it is that draws you back to that place. And you might start to notice a change in your body, the way that you sit, you know, the way that you hold yourself. If you're thinking about floating on the water down in um, Jeroa there in the estuary, then you might start to feel yourself relaxing and your breathing change. Now, if I can bring everyone back, I'd normally just leave you sitting there for a little while, but if, if I can bring you back in, would anyone like to share something about their place? Yeah, go on. <laughs> um, <laughs> mine's really quite similar to yours. It's um, coming down the top of Mount Oosley. I lived in Penrith for some time and while I was living there, any time that I came home, having grown up down here, that first moment where there's the break in the trees and you see the water instantly fills my whole chest with this kind of, I'm home. And that's a really, really connecting thing. And it's a very large part of what drew me back down to the coast. Yeah, that's lovely. Thank you, Sally. Anybody else?
Sorry, Kath, the host wouldn't let me in before. <laughs> so Jade's going to tell us about his place then. You have to bring me in. I know that, Jade. No, no, that's no, that's okay, Jade. What I've got, what I've just asked everyone to do is just to reflect, to reflect for a moment on, on their place. So where they feel drawn to. And Sally's just shared with us that sense of up at the top of Mount Oosley, just as the trees start to clear, and you can look through. And I get that at mm. at Bulli at Bulli Pass because that's where um, I live in Bulli, and so I come down there and I have this sense of home. And then as I descend down, and I've got the escarpment. And I just just feeling held in that in that space, you know. The yeah, point that I'm trying to, the point that I'm I guess where I'm trying to bring us back to is that we've all got these experiences and these relationships, and it might be something like down at the boneyard where you go with your family, and you're watching the kids surf. It might be, you know, that it's an annual pilgrimage to a place where you meet with extended family and you're coming back together. And so it brings up all of those sorts of emotions and all of those relationships. And that's really where I'm, where I'm coming back to for today. And what I think is really significant about this seminar in particular is that it's all about relationships. So if I bring back that back to some of the research that we've done in the governing and guiding stream, where we've looked at the different values and the different value sets that are included within ocean governance spaces. And it'll come as no surprise to most people that, you know, in terms of the context, you know, there's a lot around the economy, like the economics and a lot around the biophysical. But what's left out often, what people or what governance structures struggle to deal with is these the social aspects even the aesthetics you know the significance that and i'm an, i'm a highlander so freshwater so for me it's all about the escarpment you know the significance that it doesn't matter where you are in the illawarra what street you're on at some point on that street you'll be within sort of within sight and within the shadow of the escarpment you know there's the significance of even the aesthetics around that and of course the cultural significance which is something that i'm sort of passionate about, particularly within a lands council space. So within that, unpacking that even further, the relational values, the ones that, that look at or that recognise the significance of relationships in and of themselves, as opposed to a means to an end. You know, they're often underrepresented, if at all, um, within this space and within governance. And so for me, what, is really exciting about this seminar and about the, the speakers that are going to follow is that really there's an exploration and a the articulation of some of those relationships in different ways. So within the governing and guiding stream, um, some work that we've had to hold off because of COVID um, is looking at ways that we can bring those relationships and those values into, um, into governance and into communication, so the relationships with each other as well as with the environment, our responsibilities, rather than just our rights in these spaces. And with that, I'm going to hand over. Thank you, Catherine. That's a really excellent way of, of us thinking about today. And I, I think you've transformed, I think, the direction we'll be taking today, which is what has been happening in all of our conversations in Blue Futures. I'm going to hand over to the, the amazing pair um, of Agnieszka and, and Joe Sterling, who will be um, talking about the spectacular Waste to Water exhibition at Wollongong Art Gallery uh, right now. And we've got, yeah, we've got props for this. But yeah, so Joe and Agnieszka, uh, thank yeah. you so much. But yeah, and thank you so much, Catherine, for your, for your um, sharing. And we'll, we'll, we'll jump back to that later. Yes, thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Catherine. I feel much more grounded. I was jittery, mm. jittery. And thinking about the waterfall that's just, just close by to me is always a place that helps me settle listening to the sound of water it's fantastic so i'm going to kick us off by sharing my screen um hang on here we go we do have slides to share because we've got lots of visual candy for you <laughs> <laughs> slideshow um of course so how's that can everybody see that okay okay so <laughs> so um, 
we'll get started. Thank you all so much for, for joining us today and, and for the opportunity to speak about the exhibition that Agnieszka and myself have curated, Ways to Water. Um, it's truly been a unique privilege to work on this project over, over the last two years. And together, um, Agnieszka and I have um, enjoyed collaborating, I'd say, on every aspect of this project, including this presentation, which we will both be speaking to throughout, throughout the slides. And I just wanted to mention, for those of you who, who aren't aware, the, the exhibition's open currently and it will be closing in February, February the 6th, and it's showing in the Mantatlo Gallery. So um, for anyone who hasn't been to see it, um, Take your, take your chance before the 6th of February to go and have a look at the show. So I'll hand over to you next, Ag. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. So um, the, the central kind of curatorial question that um, we were faced with was how to curate this exhibition of wastewater within the Mentetlo Gallery. And you can see in the, well, on my left hand side, top, top right hand, corner, it's a glass cabinet um, gallery that consists of very large, um, 10 actually cabinets, usually dedicated to um, collection works. Um, there are issues around that I'm not going to go into. There are issues around, um, particularly when you when one thinks about waste to water and um, the trajectory and kind of um, parameters and guidelines and um, inspirations behind the Blue Futures project um, attached to the cabinet. So uh, Joe and I um, use the concept of Wunderkammering, and um, I can talk about that a little bit later for people that are interested, as a curatorial strategy that brings diverse objects together into one space to unsettle colonialist histories and raise cultural and environmental awareness. So we were very fortunate um, to find the work of the highly recognized contemporary artist and academic Brooke Gerwa Andrew, and his work is on my right in the top corner. Um, and he is a Wagari, um, from Wagari Nation, um, land of the three rivers of New South Wales, and his work is in the work collection. So he actually uses Yvonne Cameron to reconfigure and expose overlooked Aboriginal stories in um, Australian narrative. Brooke is very supportive of the exhibition and of the Blue Futures project. He said it's a beautiful idea and he can't wait to see the images. So through the covering, um, Brooks and local um, art artists, Ewan and Darrell artists, Phil, um, Phyllis Stewart's tiny shoes um, slippers and thongs were brought together into one cabinet titled Water Travels to highlight histories of indigenous ways of knowing as valuable insights into sustainable future developments. Mm. Yo. So Wollongong Art Gallery collection holds almost 3,000 works um, in their collection. It's quite extraordinary. And, and we were able to view all of these digitally it took us a while, um, but it was during COVID, so we had access digitally to those to those images before selecting a short list of, of around about a hundred that we viewed in in real life um, on on the gallery premises when we were able to. So we had a, a bit of a, a selection criteria for this, um, which I can speak to a little bit more next. But really, of course, we were thinking of water. Illawarra, Shoalhaven, ocean, river, lake, coastal change, diversity of voices, of course, materials of the local really came up for us and, and also the non-human inhabitants of, of this place. So making sure that both indigenous and non-indigenous female and male artists were represented and that exhibition didn't elevate one work above another but put artworks into a dialogue with each other was important. Um, the focus of the exhibition on the local was really set by the perimeters of the Blue Futures project. We were searching um, for, as a result of that, we were searching for artworks that were made in New South Wales on country and responded to themes of water. Um, we found 39 artworks in the web collection. 
when we put um, these works side by side and over you know a while over time these artworks started to form stories those stories then became the nine themes for each of the nine cabinets um, in the exhibition so the cabinet that you can see um, here is titled from the mountain and there you can see the bait trap woven by vigil artist Stephen Russell and his work speaks to Robert Westmacott's early colonial lithograph, which depicts local Aboriginal people catching fish using traditional methods in Condens Creek, set against the backdrop of the ocean and a ship anchored on the horizon. The, ca the cabinet together, all the works together in the cabinet highlight shifts in local ecologies, and renders water as a significant ingredient for the nourishment of all life. Okay. So, Ag, do you want to speak to this? Yeah. Beautiful slide we have here. <laughs> now, um, I don't know if Jade can see himself. I think you're driving, Jade. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, at the heart of the exhibition is a didgeridoo um, created by you and artist Craig Cruz. And for a while, um, the middle cabinet, which is D1, you can see that on the plan, was a big question mark. It just nothing quite worked. Um, for, for that particular space. And, you know, uh, talking about how does, you know, how do we embed Aboriginal knowledges? Um, I was talking to Joe about it and I kind of say, you know, it's kind of listening, right? So we remembered that Jade said to us, you know, ask and country will respond. And we <laughs> actually took that really seriously and literally we're in Jeringong, we put our feet on the ground. We said, what should go into this middle cabinet? Like, what is it? And pretty much within three hours, Jay told us very generously, shared a story about this didgeridoo, um, and which is actually on loan, which we are also very grateful for, um, on loan from the Faculty of Engineering and Information Sciences from University of Wollongong. To, to present this um, didgeridoo involved 13 people <laughs> to get it to the exhibition. Um, it is also presented in a particular way. It's activated as though one would be holding it, someone would be holding it. So it's not traditionally um, presented as that um, in the museums. But um, it's supposed to be, it wanted to be there from the very beginning at the middle of the of the gallery and the entire collection rotates around this center. Beautiful. Should I go to the next one? Yes, please. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm just gonna speak a little bit about um, Agnieszka and I had this beautiful opportunity to go on many field trips. Um, so we've researched for and visited almost all of the locations depicted in the exhibition and spent time there. Uh, several visits were often needed. In this way, being on country really became central to our research practice and to the curatorial approach as well to the exhibition. So in this particular slide, you can see um, um, Max Dupain's 1957 photograph of Stanwell Park Beach. And we discovered to our delight that the tree in foreground you see there is actually still, is actually still there. Um, and we also witnessed, um, often you do, up, up the top there, hang gliders taking off. Um, we were able to marvel at this really spectacular location. So it's, it's also, um, it also came to our attention that this, this particular spot has been represented by many, many artists over time um, and that, were, that are held in the collection as well very significant spot. Um, this work, um, Agnieszka was very inspired by Margaret Olley's era landscape from 1946. Um, and here we, we kind of believe that, you know, Margaret must have been sitting on country here to capture this secluded landscape. Um, and she's also, it's an unusual work because um, the majority of, of Margaret Olley's work is, is still life. So it was quite extraordinary to come across this landscape piece in, in the collection where she, um, she depicts the historic beach shacks, 
this was probably following the depression era, era and um, also amidst a thriving um, artistic community. So I insisted that we visit Era Beach. Um, it's a little tricky to get to. It's it's quite steep, <laughs> isn't it, Agnieszka? <laughs> a little bit steep. Um, and Agnieszka also decided that we would um, we would attempt some plein air working on country, drawing on country. So we we carried quite a lot of materials with us on this adventure um, to Era Beach. And it was it was quite an extraordinary day that we had. I'll pass to I, I, did, I just have to say something about the the era beach um, episode. First of all, <laughs> incredibly grateful to Joshua and Michelle for signing the paperwork mm. because Joe had to cross the um, the boundary between the the COVID regions, what was allowed, and we had this amazing paper, essential research. You know what that <laughs> meant for practicing, you know, designers and artists who had this like look this is like really essential let me in so that was amazing <laughs> that was um and and um, and pretty much i packed up my entire house all my materials because i was so excited but joe was carrying it all because <laughs> i pretty much made made up first first 20 stairs and that was it i couldn't believe it what a location who even bothers like, <laughs> so beautiful anyway it nearly killed me but, um, so I'm even more impressed by Margaret Ollie, I have to say. There you go. Um, okay, so um, of course, uh, we also visited um, the um, Lake Illawarra, walked around its edges, photographed it, and um, the important discovery here was that you can see in the lower, um, lower image is the Kajarina, Kajarina that grows around its edges and actually is falling in as well. And so um, that that idea of the the art material um, being local and growing and um, impregnating artworks with the kind of local DNA started to stir here. Yes, Joe. Next one is good. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah, so it was important to present artworks also in the exhibition that simultaneously engage with WEG collections. WEG was our partner that was very generous as well, and the Blue Futures project. So the approach that um, ocean-based sustainable development is intrinsically connected to meaningful engagement, uh, engagement and acknowledgement um, of country. So in this particular work titled Traces, um, is made using ecologically sustainable materials and processes. A reclaimed silk is dyed using eco print method that doesn't use any chemicals. Um, and the local natural dye is um, obtained from casuarina found along the edges during our research on country around Lake Illawarra. Hence stitching as a slow meditative method of making its use to trace the fragmented edges and contours of local landscapes painted very, very, very early on by two women artists, um, Jessie Scarville, that you can see on top, and Margaret Ollie. And I did the Wunderkammerin, you know, I jammed them together. Um, so for me, the traces kind of revisits individual and shared memories and histories um, through the nexus of these traces, um, including the dye. Thanks, Joe. So the series is um, in part of Water Bodies. It's also a new body of work that was created specifically for the exhibition. Each work is positioned purposefully in response to the surrounding cabinet themes and features significant watery places as well in the Illawarra and Shoalhaven regions. But I'm, I'm kind of looking from a visualising from an aerial perspective here. Each multi-layered digital print, we've got um, Lake Illawarra, the Shoalhaven River and Wary Lagoon highlights the dynamic and sensitive ecological zones where fresh, bitter and salt waters meet. Water Bodies is inspired by being in these places and also uses satellite images, as I mentioned, to explore the physical forms um, and to draw attention to the unique estuarine communities inhabiting these often endangered ecological communities that are in these kind of vulnerable spaces between land and sea. Okay, 
Okay. Um, the uh, Mangrove Futures is an um, collaborative, interactive AR 3D animation artwork that kind of looks like a sculpture. <laughs> it's doing a lot of things. It's a mangrove, yeah, that exists in the virtual um, space and appears in the real world. So viewers can scan a large icon on the gallery floor, hold up their device, and mangrove um, emerges in front of them, and they can um, manipulate the scale as well. So this particular work draws on field research um, on country and the encounter with a single mangrove in Shell Haven, Alfred Coffey's painting of Lake Illawarra, into which Jade actually embedded a story of UN country and mangroves as well. Jade's story then guided us to present mangrove taka artwork created by Reggie Ryan, um, a Biripi artist, in the um, towards the lake cabinet. So you can see how the layers, um, the layers of um, the different influences um, and knowledges actually resonate in this particular work. Okay. And we wanted an entity, didn't we? To yes, enter we did. the, enter the gallery. Um, I should mention that the, the visual language for the exhibition and design elements, I, I suppose, are, have been developed as well to, to, to provide a sort of visual supporting framework that doesn't interfere with the artwork or the embedded stories. So it's, it's a, more of a supporting space um, for, for things to be held. So while the augmented reality can be experienced in the gallery space, um, the printed catalogue provides future connections as well to the exhibition. So each cabinet has a uniquely designed QR code. You can see one of those there. That was the one for to the sand cabinet. Um, and they stand on the back of the catalogue as well to access the AR experience, which is often a nice thing to do to take, kind of take the exhibition with you and sit down with it and experience the, there's quite a lot of writing and stories that are included. Um, so you can take that after you've visited the exhibition as well. So in this way, the exhibition and stories can be, be carried and, and accessed into the future. Um, as well. So here you'll see um, the AR interface, just a couple of slides of that, because this became quite a significant part of the development in the project as well, and a place for us to house um, a lot of the content and information. But um, we wanted to provide an uncluttered sort of intuitive extra experience that holds quite a lot of information. It holds the cabinet stories, it holds artwork images as well, um, and details about those artworks. Um, they're also provided here, but importantly, it was always really our intention to use the augmented reality as a storytelling tool, as a way to sort of house, house other stories um, across the researchers, across the whole Blue Futures project. So some of these stories, um, are personal um, and speak to the artworks and themes directly and some of these stories from other researchers relate to broader yet um, connect to topics kind of that have that have risen up because of the themes in the catalogue in the cabinets themselves so researchers also provided some really beautiful images to accompany their stories and some of those you can you can see here so so these stories are able to be accessed um, after the after the duration of the exhibition as well and we'll okay so this, um this particular work um responds to the absence of local wild animals in artworks by non-indigenous artists in work collection um, the worker reimagines the southern right whale it plays with size comparison charts that show the enormity of this um, marine mammal compared to humans but instead of size comparison this sculpture, which is hard, uh, which is hand carved from found wood, is presented as a scaled model to depict the whale and a human um, figure standing side by side and looking ahead into the future. So in summary, it is not possible um, to curate a show about coastal change without thinking about the colonial history and occupation, the waves of change in migration, um, marine um, urbanization, ecological crisis, economic sustainability, and non-human creatures inhabiting the place. We hope that the exhibition opens a space for 
um, asking questions like, how am I engaging with South Coast? The great potential, I think, of, um, of art and design coming together is to offer an opportunity for reflection and self-evaluation, which then can lead to sustainable development. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Agneska and Joe. It's it's uh, the the exhibition experience is actually um, is truly beautiful, and to know that it's it's based on 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 so much um, engagement with being on country and engaging with the presence of real places uh, it really um, adds. It doesn't even add to it. it. It's it's what makes it so strong. So thank you so much for articulating that today, and we'll talk. A little bit further about some of those embodied experiences later on because I think they'll come into discussion. Um, I'm also going to be talking about a, a place um, that I belong to or it belongs to me. I don't know what what that what how we talk about it but I'm going to be talking about a place which I if you know me this is a place that I endlessly talk about. Um, I'm talking about the Continental Pool um, in Wollongong um, and I'm a writer um, and so what I'm interested in, 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 in my engagement with space and others' engagement with, with, with place is this idea, well, hang on, I'm just going to try and move to the next slide, there it is, is to think about the ways in which stories um, might allow people to consider more broadly their relationship um, with place. Um, so I'm drawn to the, this quote here by Amitav Ghosh, who says, talks about the great irreplaceable potentiality of fiction is that it makes possible the imagining of possibilities. And that stuck with me a lot during the during the Blue Futures um, question in particular about what what kind of future are we giving to this to this place that we care about these places that we care about. So I think telling stories is part of the way in which we maintain our well being, and also the ways in which we make meaningful connections with our planet. So one of my roles, I think, in Blue Futures has been to to try and listen to the stories that people tell about coastal spaces. And over the last two years, I've been focusing on a specific place, but I, I, I really hope to broaden that discussion in, in the years to come. So I've been thinking about this place, the Continental Pool, or as, as many people call it, the Conti. Um, and if you don't know where it is, it's, the, um, it's the, located between Wollongong Harbour and North Beach in Wollongong. For those of you who have never been there, um, it, there are two pools that sit in the Conti. Uh, both are painted egg blue and wrinkled with cracks. Um, there's a stain at the end of the big um, big pool as if the rocks are seeping through. And one of the people I spoke to said that it reminds her of a Klimt painting. And she always swims over it and thinks about the Klimt artwork, which I think is, is kind of gorgeous. In some of these pools are packed on winter mornings. Maybe there's five swimmers in the lap pool and two people nattering up and down in the small pool. There are also the shark baiters who I'm trying to get involved with, um, who use the sheds before clambering over the rocks and into the ocean. Although in COVID, they have found their own change room um, on, the, on the rocks themselves. I've been interested in, in the stories from the pool for a while. If you sit on the steps of the Continental Pool, you hear all sorts of stories. Um, and so I've only been sitting there for 11 or 12 years and only really been braving the last three winters. So I'm definitely what the regulars would call a newbie to this space. Over the last two years, I've been having conversations with the regulars um, and some of them have been there their whole lives, which um, was well, somebody recently celebrated their 95th birthday sitting on those steps. Um, I've been asking them about their experiences in and around the pool. And from asking those questions, I've also been asking them to imagine the future of this coastal environment. By making this connection between past, present and future, I'm hoping to allow the swimmers to recognise how much they already value about the coastal environment and how much they're part of a much bigger story. This sense of an entangled relationship with place is of course not new and Jade, you are there quoted uh, here to talk a little bit further about that. Uh, this, this entangled relationship with place is not new, it's just overlooked by some of the newbies um, who have arrived here a few hundred years ago. We've been talking uh, about in, in these seminars in Blue Futures, um, how much we aim to hold Indigenous knowledges at the heart of research process and to transform our research practices. And this, this um, discussion that has been led by, by Jade and by Catherine and by Paul um, to be thinking about these, these relationships with country have been really kind of important to the way in which I framed this, um, my, my research. 
So if you were able to, if you were able to come to our session at the beginning of November, you will have heard Jade sharing with us what he calls the five fingers of country. He talks about the geography, the geology, the weather. He talks about who interacts with the space, what draws them there. And Jade uses people to include all living things, human and non-human, animals and plants, the rocks, the water. We also think about the rituals and the activities that we undertake, the values that we share, the experiences that we have had and that other people before us have had in these, in these spaces. And by considering these, we bring together into a, a respectful and interconnected knowledge of the place. Jade reminds us that we carry with these in our bodies and he talks about the five fingers on your hand. And I think that's something which I think about a lot when I go through the water, the hand is the thing that's driving me through the water. Um, and so I think that that's really important. These five fingers on our hands guides us and leads us through our encounters with country. It's really a, a crucial to note that by taking on this understanding of country, I'm really mindful of not colonizing Aboriginal knowledges to, to my own gain. And that's been an interesting thing for me to think about how much can I engage with this and how much am I, am I able to think about this in, in a respectful way, I suppose. But what I always love about Jade is that he says, mate, you're part of it. And he says, um, he talks about country being a dynamic and changing and inclusive environment. And in a, um, a book that we all wrote together a couple of years ago, he said, says, learn from country, become familiar with your place. You've got to be in relationship with the story of your place and your story within your place. And that has resonated with me significantly over the last few years. We all have a connection to place. We can learn from Indigenous encounters with country to deepen our engagement with the places that we care about. So part of my listening to has been also to consider the ways in which the Conti can connect or might connect in similar ways to place. So today I just want to share really briefly um, some of the stories about the Conti and how much they might uh, be linked to these five fingers of country. We're mainly old bodies that sit on these steps, a few younger bodies wishing that we were old and didn't have to go to work and could sit on the steps for longer. From the steps, we see pelicans and cormorants and whales. The shark baiters return with stories of stingrays and gropers and banjo sharks. And this morning I saw the most beautiful stingray um, in, the, in the water. And that's my dog. The men like to sit around in, in the steps on their undies until the lifeguard says, come on fellas. And the women are similarly un uninhibited. One of the youngest, younger swimmers tells me about in the women's change rooms, I was in the change rooms and I put too much body lotion on. A couple of the ladies proceeded to wipe all the body lotion off my naked body so it wouldn't go to waste. They're like, oh, don't worry about it. Here, let me grab some of that. And I'm just like, if you explain this to anybody else, it would seem really inappropriate, but that's just life down here. The culture then is one of intimacy. Another swimmer comments, the community down here is like an extended family to me. It's just like going home every day. Central to the community are conversations that take place on these, on these steps. Another swimmer explains, it st often starts with how's the water, but then it goes in all sorts of directions. The value I place on social connections for the pool is much more than I ever thought I would find for that kind of space. I think that even though I don't see people for, for very long, I feel a strength of relationships. I have to spend a lot more time with people to get that level of comfort and understanding. The pool seems to fast track that. In fact, this sense of community is part of the Conti's foundations. It's called the Continental because it was the first ocean pool in the region where women and men were allowed to swim together like they do in exotic Europe. The actual building of the baths too was a community event. The slab was laid by volunteer men and the local paper thanks the volunteer women for providing sandwiches on the day. Once opened in March 1923, it immediately became an essential hub of the town. Many of the stories told by regulars, and you can see that I'm sharing some stories on screen as well as me talking, um, have, have talked about, they all often begin their story with their childhood and are tangled up with community. So another swimmer says to me, the, uh, my earliest memory of these people who were very, very well tanned, who'd spent hours and hours getting this tan up, and then suddenly the melanoma strikes, strikes and it all stops. And this last comment uh, shows up another kind of journey that we're, we're intimately linked to with the pool. 
people spend their lives in this space. People spend the go every day and they're part of this largest kind of journey. Also, several men have had heart attacks in the pool. And I also heard a story from somebody whose waters broke in the water. Um, one person who had a heart attack is now affectionately known as the flatliner. And we refer to this heart attack on a daily basis. When one of the shark baiters takes their final plunge, a plaque is secretly affixed to the rocks and they're only visible at low tide. So there's something really interesting about that, I think, as well. The architect, Nicole Larkin, notes that ocean pools facilitate heightened experiences with coastal landscapes. Even though this is something which has been imposed on the rocks, it seems to be somehow incorporated into the larger stories around this space. And the way in which the water comes in from the ocean into the pool is something which is really important to this space, I think. So a swimmer says to me, a, a swimming feels like coming back to life for me. It's like being shocked back to life. And an, another swimmer plunges deeper. He says, the ocean is embedded into me because we are water, right? In motion. And water communicates to itself. So water within us and ocean water, we talk to each other on a vibrational level. We also reflect on the atmosphere. If you have the, the joy of being able to swim in this pool as the sun is rising, it's a magical experience. And the swimmer tells me that she lies back on her back in the, in the water and look at the stars as they disappear, the sky. And that's her special treat, she says at the end. The experience of being in the water and in the sun or underneath the, the rain sometimes changes who we are. A swimmer says, if you're not feeling great when you go, when you don't, when you go down there, after you've had a swim, it's uplifting. I always feel better after I've had a swim. The pool then is an integral part of people's lives. The site that brings people, community, memory and place together. Many of the swimmers say something like, being in the water is as spiritual as I feel. And often it begins with, that, that sentence begins with, I'm not really spiritual, but being in the water is as spiritual as I feel. Another swimmer says it's good for the soul, spirit, psyche, whatever you want to call it. So everybody's trying to downplay this experience, but it's actually something which is so vital to their, their, their time in the water. Another swimmer says, I can never see myself moving that far from the pool. I couldn't give it up. But what happens if we have to? Of course, the question that's, that everyone has at the moment is what's going to happen over summer? Um, and, but what also we want to think about is beyond that. What's going to happen next year or in the next 20 years or in the next 100 years? The pool community isn't entirely in agreement about climate change, um, but their connection to this place connects them to their surroundings in an, in an implicit way. Our conversation on the steps drifts to, into topics like storm surges and geotechnical failure of the cliff line. The shark baiters come back with stories of a depletion of marine life. Lobster and brim have been replaced by the swimmers, by what the swimmers call jimbles, and I've got a scar to prove it, um, which are like a, 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 a relative of the, of the box jellyfish. They sting you very lightly, but they sting you. Um, one of my swimmers tells me that they were never there, and then 10 years ago, they arrived. There's also this cement fence between the pool and the ocean, which is a recent addition um, to, to respond to, to changes in the ocean swell. A swimmer laments, you could be used to be able to swim in the water and be looking out at the ocean. I have to say, I really miss that. I can understand why they built it, but it's been a real disappointment to me. And the biggest fear of the future seems to be how we might respond to population growth in the region. So lots of people talk about there are too many people now, too many people in the water. And at first glance, this statement seems to go against this idea of community, which is being valued by the regulars. But I think if we return to the five fingers of country, perhaps we might find a way to resolve this tension. A swimmer complains that the new swimmers uh, don't have an understanding of the rules and the lanes. I'm here every day, all day, every year. So come on guys, just read the signs. Another shark baiter says, occasionally we have new people coming to join us. They don't seem to last very long, but there's a new group of younger people. They seem to get on really well and they seem to be stayers. The stayers perhaps are the ones I think who might read the signs, who respect the people, the culture, the history and the place itself, and who value this place in its entirety, who are willing to sit with us on the steps or in the water and have a chat looking out, the, out at the sea and the sky.
Thank you very much. And I will stop sharing. So thank you for letting me share the story of the space. I'm now going to, we're now going to move on to another uh, ocean space on the other side um, of Australia. And Freya is going to talk to us a little bit about her PhD project. Um, and yeah, so Freya, thank you, take it away. Thank you, Joshua. Um, yeah, so moving away from Wollongong entirely, um, but still thinking about people's relationship with ocean spaces. So I'll just share my screen and then I'll get into that. I'm hoping that's working now. Awesome. Um, yeah, so today I'll be talking about the research that I'm doing as part of my PhD, which is essentially concerned with human relationships with ocean spaces. And while this isn't sort of directly related to the Blue Futures Project, there are sort of a lot of overlaps in terms of thinking about how we might interact with the ocean and also thinking about what our relationship with the ocean sort of might be like moving um, forward into a blue future. Um, so yeah, I've always been interested in thinking about what motivates people to care about the environment and specifically marine environments. And that led me to the research that I've been doing as part of my PhD. Um, so I'm looking at the embodied and at times highly emotional reef encounters that occur at Ningaloo Reef in Western Australia. And I'm particularly interested in these sort of like big ticket experiences. So things like swimming with humpback whales um, and whale sharks and manta rays. And if these encourage people to have a sort of more ecocentric outlook um, and or if they facilitate facilitate the uptake of sustainable behaviour practices. So the research um, I've been doing um, has been taking place at Ningaloo Reef, which is a really special place. Um, and it's about as far as you can get from Wollongong in an Australian sense, as you can kind of see there on that map. Um, but, you know, hopefully we can still get a sense of human ocean relationships. Um, and Ningaloo is a World Heritage listed reef. So it's a fringing reef, which means that it's just off the shore, which you can kind of see in the picture on the slide that it's sort of just directly off the beach. Um, and it's a truly incredible place. So the abundance and diversity of marine life there is actually like quite astounding. Um, and there's times when you're there where you sort of just feel like you're in a real life aquarium. And look, coral reefs are a really interesting um, and at times very depressing ecosystem to sort of immerse yourself in and to study. And I'm sure it sort of comes as no surprise to anyone here that the world's coral reefs are in a pretty dire situation in the face of anthropogenic climate change. So research sort of suggests that they're perhaps the most endangered ecosystem globally. And they're regarded as the canary in the coal mine really when it comes to sort of the marine world, meaning that they're a pretty good indicator um, of the health of the ocean more generally. So, you know, that is research that suggests that if climate change continues unabated, then coral reefs as we know them will be extinct by the end of the century. Um, and it's kind of predicted that this will be sort of like a domino effect in which it will cause the collapse of other ocean ecosystems. So in light of that, um, I find this if it will work, quote by Rachel Carson, which she interestingly wrote in 1951 um, to be quite a pertinent analysis of what's actually sort of going on. So she writes, it's a curious situation that the sea from which life first arose should now be threatened by the activities of one form of that life. But the sea, though changed in a sinister way, will continue to exist. The threat is rather to life itself. So I think what has sort of always really struck me is that people, at least to some degree, know that this is happening. Um, they're aware of the environmental degradation. They're aware um, that coral reefs, as we know them, may soon be extinct. And yet this doesn't sort of seem to be a particularly urgent call to action. So I'm sort of really interested to know what motivates people to care. And research sort of has suggested that through having an emotional connection, people can be more compelled to care. Um, so with this in mind, I was really interested in seeing how emotions play out in coral reef encounters, um, especially what are these sort of often highly emotive bucket list encounters and whether they do lead to these conservation outcomes. And I think it, what's sort of interesting is that tourism um, in, in marine environments is sort of considered to be both part of the solution and part of the problem when it comes to conservation. Um, but there is a recognition that the sort of non-consumptive side of wildlife tourism is an important tool for re-engaging people with nature and to explore why nature holds significance for people and can lead to people changing the way they think about and engage with the natural world. Um, and because of that, there is this sort of increasing demand for tourism experiences that contain learning outcomes and encourage the uptake of pro-environmental attitudes. 
So it's sort of that idea of like you're being in there, you're experiencing it, you're there on the reef, you're engaging with these non-human elements. And it's this idea that through having those experiences, you get that sort of emotional connection and that in a perfect world should inspire you to, to care more about the future of, of these spaces. So the main aim um, of my research was to really analyse the role that emotions play throughout reef experiences. So I was lucky enough to spend three months, quite a while back now, but three months living in Exmouth. Um, and I worked with two different tour companies. Um, and when they had space on their boats, I was able to go out with them. Um, I'd hand out surveys, I'd talk to people, I would observe them. And I was really interested in kind of getting people's emotional attachments, their relationships and their responses to the encounter and the experience more generally. So I sort of did some quantitative work. I surveyed, surveyed tourists at the beginning of the trip before they had the encounter, also at the end of the trip. And then I sent a follow-up survey eight months after um, to sort of gauge if there'd been any change in attitude or conservation behavior over that time. Um, and I also interviewed people sort of six to eight months after the experience, as well as sort of drawing on my own auto autoethnographic research of being there, being in place, swimming with humpbacks, swimming with whale sharks. Um, and I suppose sort of what is fair to say is that these encounters often generated a highly emotional response. Um, and you can sort of see that um, by some of the words on the slide there. And it sort of just re really reinforced how these experiences can bring up a lot of emotions. So just to paint a bit of a picture for you, and I hope this works, um, I'm gonna read you a vignette that I put together based on my own experiences and the observations and responses of participants. Um, and I'll play you some videos to go along with it. So I took all of these and I do really apologize that they might be a little bit sort of shonky, um, but they are quite useful, I think, in painting, an experience, painting a picture of what the actual experience is. Um, but they're very shaky handheld things. So they, I do apologize, they may make you feel a little seasick at times. Um, go, yells the deckhand. I stick the snorkel in my mouth, hold onto my mask with one hand and stand up and leap off the boat. My fins hit the water first and bend. My whole body then follows. My head goes completely under and the familiar feeling of water surrounding me comes over my body. The water feels cold despite the wetsuit. Once my head is above the water again, I look around to get my bearings. I spot the guide in the water yelling at the group. Quickly, I clear my snorkel of water, put it in my mouth and hurriedly swim towards my guide. The excitement and the adrenaline is making my heart beat slightly fast. I become aware of the sound of my breathing through the snorkel. I jostle into the line, copping a few kicks from wayward fins. There seem to be limbs and fins flailing everywhere. The water is crystal clear and visibility is great, aside from the bubbles being created by other tourists but I'm still slightly confused as to where I should be and where I should be looking. I'm a little nervous and apprehensive, still hoping for the optimal experience. I hear the call face down and I tilt my head, looking around unsure of where the whale shark is coming from. I turn around and all of a sudden, a massive dark shape is coming toward me. I realize quickly that it's a whale shark and it's fast approaching, mouth first. My initial reaction is shock and fear. This giant animal with a huge gaping mouth is swimming at me. I quickly get out of its path and watch as it glides past. Once the initial shock has passed, I realize that this is my opportunity to keep swimming with this giant fish. I get my legs into gear and start frantically kicking. I swim alongside it. It feels absolutely magical. It feels like it's just me and this beautiful animal. And for a while, I feel like I'm in another world. Time seems to have stopped. And I feel a surge of awe and respect. I also feel very grateful to be there in the water. I'm mesmerized. Its beautiful pattern is reflecting in the sunlight. Um, so hopefully that sort of helped in painting a bit of a picture about what some of these in water embodied experiences are like. And I must admit for me, the most magical experience are sort of the ones with the humpback whales, but I don't have any videos of them because they're quite fleeting and very hard to capture. They move very quickly. Um, and yeah, so I won't have time to share too much detail about the results from this study, but if, if you are interested, you know, I'd obviously be more than happy to share the more quantitative behavior change results with you later or some of my sort of considerations about what the results mean. So things I'm sort of interested in at the moment include the role of time in these experiences and within the conservation rhetoric. Um, but I think sort of largely what I wanna focus on today is the responses that people had um, and the emotional relationships that they formed. And I think it's really important to note 
The participants had complex emotional responses to the experiences at every stage of their trip. So this included um, pre-trip, so their sort of anticipations and expectations. It included um, during the trip, immediately after, and then months down the track in reflection. Um, sort of emotions were heavily embedded in all of those moments. Um, and I think it's also sort of important to think about the way that those emotional experiences were all interacted with each other in very complex way, and that not all of the emotions that emerged were necessarily positive. And there were some really interesting sort of themes that emerged, um, one of which that I won't have much time to go into, but was this idea of people overcoming a, a fear or a physical barrier was a really big thing for people. Also pride in other people um, came up a lot and also the joy of like sharing the experience with others was something that came up a lot as well. Um, but for now, I just sort of want to look at some of the quotes that illustrate the ways in which these experiences positively impacted on people and reinforced or develop their connection to the marine environment. So firstly, um, one respondent states, if I can stop playing mantra videos, um, I knew I would like it and I would enjoy it. I didn't realise how emotional I'd get being so close and being in the water with them and being able to hear them and seeing their tiny little eyes to this great big body. Just amazing. It was just, it's something that words are really hard to put together because it's fabulous, amazing, out of this world and all of that really isn't enough. Um, and then this respondent, um, the next respondent, sorry, talks about the way that the experience sort of made them reflect on their own life when they got back and it sort of gave them this extra perspective. So they said, diving with the whale shark is something people only read about and it's a world away. But to experience the true vastness of the marine park and be in the same proximity of a living wonder is something everyone should try to experience. It puts more things into perspective than you'd expect. You reflect on more of what's outside of your own bubble. Um, and for the this next quote as well, um, sort of shows the power that these experiences had in creating perspective about what was important. So again, on reflection, this person states, I cried when I got home because I was humbled at my ability to experience what I experienced. It was an experience that put superficial things on the back burner because you're not caring about who is dating who or who said what about someone. You are amongst and immersed in the most natural and raw thing possible. For this next participant, it was the deeper appreciation and understanding that they got from being there and having this experience that stood out. They said, I think there are so many people that actually never experience anything like that, this. They are just in the cities and they don't care and they don't experience it. There are many people that are just never touched by it at all. So to be able to be touched by it, you get a deeper appreciation and understanding. And I sort of always like this quote because I think it quite nicely looks at the way that these experiences can directly change your consumer practices and your habits. So they sort of reconfigured their behaviour based on, for them, realising the beauty of the world. Um, and they sort of talk about the fact that after being in this pristine reef environment and then going home and seeing things on the internet, which sort of showed the devastating effects of plastics, um, they then sort of st stopped shopping if they didn't have reusable shopping bags or stopped um, getting a coffee unless they had their reusable mug with them. And they said, I think it's that juxtaposition between the, that real appreciation of my place in the world and the beauty of the world that certainly increases my dedication to do conservation. Um, and finally, this next quote to me really sort of emphasises the importance of the ocean in the lives of many people. Um, so in this, um, the respondent uses the word sacred and for this participant being on the reef sort of helped them to feel really alive. They say, in terms of the reef itself, I think the sacred thing is the ability of people to get lost in nature, like to really feel alive again and to lose everything else in their lives and just be there and just be stunned and be in awe. So sort of what I hope these um, quotes have shown is that experiences on and with the ocean hold an important part in the lives of people. Um, relationships and emotions are often sort of left out of, um, think of the decisions that are made in ocean governance and thinking about the future of the oceans. But I think when we consider a blue future and the decisions that are made um, that govern the way we move forward, I believe it's sort of really important to consider the breadth and scope of human ocean relationships the ways in which these experiences in oceans move us and the emotions that we hold towards ocean spaces and ocean experiences. And I, you know, there were so many quotes throughout all my research that could have really spoken to this. Um, and I could have talked for days and days and days, but I hope that did give you a bit of an idea about how, um, yeah, how emotive some of these experiences can be and how they can really help people to form a connection with um, marine spaces. So thank you.
Thank you so much, Fred. Um, I, I, you have a look in the chat, but I'm going to sort of summarise it. That those videos are extraordinary, and that idea of being that seeing that those encounters um, just absolutely moving and, and gorgeous, and, and to hear the way in which sharing stories about that experience is, is transforming people also is incredible. There's a there's a there was a quote that somebody a phrase that somebody said in that that, that um, those interviews where they said it was an out of the world experience, which that's actually being in the world. And in some ways, we need to we need to remember that we're in that world, and that world is related. I think that that's a, a there's some interesting questions there. But we've hit um we've we've got twenty minutes left, so um I'm really mindful that we have got we we'll probably have questions and things that we want to share. Part of what we are we are doing in this in this conversation is to think about the ways in which our research practices have been been changed by Blue Futures, and how our research has been changed by our engagement with this different ways or Aboriginal ways of thinking about country, different to my original way of thinking about country. Um, so these are the questions that I'm going to be asking the panel, but maybe if, if we are thinking about those relationships, about the idea of being transformed by being part of Blue Futures, transformed by thinking in this way about country. I'm wondering if anybody in the room has any questions that they want to ask specifically about the projects um, and, and the way in which we have been changed. Or I'm wondering if, if, if panelists would like to share some of the discoveries that you've made um, more than you've already spoken about in relation to those questions about how we might be changed by these experiences. So I will be looking in the chat, but if you want to just unmute, just jump in and ask questions. Um, plunge, take the plunge. Actually, I've got one for Ag and Joe. Um, when you were talking about your curatorial approach to piecing things together, what I found really interesting in those images is that there were some in there that I probably wouldn't have really looked at personally, like if I was walking through a gallery, there was a couple of images where I, I, I wouldn't have connected to that. But as soon as I saw it next to some other pieces, and it was part of a whole story of a place, it resonated so much more with me. And I was wondering if you had experiences like that, or if that was part of putting it together yourselves? You want me to, I, I, I'll go, Joe. Um, go, yeah. Hi, Sally, yeah. But, um, you, you're such a fantastic audience for art, though. You know, you've got your, always you have your antennas <laughs> out and you kind of get it. Um, it, it took a little while. Um, the, the bringing together, the, there is some brave, what I have to say, there are some brave moves that you probably notice in the, um, in the exhibition that um, uh, non-Indigenous artists and curators are a little bit cautious of, um, of doing to bring those certain works together to create a certain story or dialogue. The reason why we were able to do it is because um, Jade said, just get on with it, just do it, you know, it's okay. Um, so you do need to have that support and, um, you know, and we kind of refer to it as an as a advisory panel. Um, and it's only because of that, only because of having blue futures, and also with the there was a conversation that I had with Catherine very first time that I met her as part of this um, uh, project as well, that encouraged pulling certain unusual things together. You know, the one artwork will speak to the other, um, or, um, or collide, or say, hey, there's a bit missing here. So yeah, yeah. It took a little while, but it, it, it was bound to happen. <laughs> Thanks, Sally, for a really excellent question. Joe, did you want to add anything to that or you're okay with? Yeah, no, I think that's really a great answer too, Ag. And um, one of the things I think really came to us early was that the thematic collection of artworks is also telling the story as well. So yeah, and, and, the, and the space itself gives us, 10 narratives i suppose that we can tell and and by forming those collisions um just just being able to house them um in that context that the gallery does a bit of that work too for us it, it helps to contain those 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 themes beautifully thank you i wonder if anybody else had, uh, nikki yes thank you Hi, I, thank you so much. I loved every minute of this panel. It was absolutely wonderful. Um, my question is about whether this transformation that Joshua just mentioned 
might mean um, transforming our sense of our place in this world and leaving a humanist perspective behind. And I was inspired to think about this, Freya, looking at some of those quotations and the um, amazing contradictions in them, um, the traces of the sublime as they talked about losing themselves in awe and wonder. But at the same time, as they described being immersed in raw nature <laughs> on a tour, <laughs> um, they also referred to it as a marine park, as though it were all there for their entertainment. So I was wondering um, whether any of your interviewees stepped outside the humanist bubble to think about the impact of, of their activities on the marine life, swimming with these humpback whales, or was it all about, this was so great for me, and I think everyone should do this, <laughs> if you see what I mean. Um, and if I might be permitted another question, um, I love the exercise you started with, Catherine, and um, I was wishing so much that so many more people could encounter this work from Joshua, Ag, and Joe in many different contexts. And I was wondering how you imagine these stories um, connecting to governance. I know that's an awfully big question, but it's something you must have all been thinking about. Um, so those are my two. I apologise yeah. for talking so long. No, Nikki, it's it's fine. They're really, really wonderful questions, and that that idea of thinking about beyond the human is really, really important uh, in this space. Freya, I wondered if if you could begin that conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you, Nikki. I think you know what you've sort of described is one of the great contradictions and one of the great. Um, questions in in like in wildlife tourism and conservation and sort of seeing that balance between being there and experiencing it but also the impact that has on the natural world and the fact that you you know you are there in this managed experience with you know 20 people circling around one animal and it is that sort of that yeah that really interesting contradiction and something that I think I'm still trying to like work out myself in terms of where I sit with that but um, I think you know for a lot of the participants a lot of it was more, you know, the me-centred thing where, you know, they've travelled to this really remote destination and they've paid a lot of money to be there and it's this one day out of their whole trip that, you know, to go out on one of these tours costs upwards of $300 a person. So it's this kind of like, I think for them, the excitement of being there at the time maybe takes them away from that um, sort of feeling of immersion and feeling of sort of ecocentrism. But I think as well there were some participants that were really aware um, of that and the impact that they were having and sort of thought more broadly about their place in the world. So, um, you know, I think, yeah, even, even though the quotes, there were a lot that sort of contradicted themselves and they sort of talk about this otherworldly experience and then sort of go and talk about, you know, buying coffee at the local shops, I think there's, I think a lot of them sort of just capture those sort of ironies in life <laughs> and sort of the way that there is people sort of trying to separate them, themselves from the from the bigger world. But yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting question. And I think I probably haven't articulated that well, but I think that's uh, something I'm still trying to grapple with too. It's incredible how it, around us, there is so much life in the ocean and there's so much life that's going on without humans i mean it, it is being obviously affected by humans in significant ways and but i'm i'm in awe in swimming in the ocean of that the experience of even just when you swim through a, a a kind of a pod of jellyfish and suddenly you've got them all kind of reeling all over your body there's something where you realize that there's a whole universe of life and experiences that i that that sitting on the edge of this weird space in wollongong that we are that is going on with, without us. And I think that's kind of really interesting in, 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 in that space to swim and, and to see that there are other lives going on, I think is really, yeah. really crucial. Uh, Catherine, I'm going to throw to you in terms of the question yep. around, around governance. Um, yeah. I'm glad it's about governance, not um, how much I love swimming in the ocean because I grew up inland, so I'm much more a freshwater swimmer. Um, so Nikki, in response to your sort of question about how how these relationships really and, and how we can shift the the face of governance or the platform there. I, I mentioned just very briefly about some of the other work that we're 
that we're looking at and, and we're doing it in a few different places, which is adopting an Aboriginal approach in particular, particular to this place because all Aboriginal knowledge and knowledge systems are place-based. So something that's very particular to Yuan country and working with individuals who make decisions really. So decision-making structures. And it's all about bringing people into relationship with place and their own values about place. So how they connect in. Um, so often, and, and yeah, I'm losing myself because we spoke about this yesterday in another seminar. So I feel like I'm doubling up. The, um, so, so often having sat on decision-making groups, like we find ourselves either we're there, we're giving information, like we're providing information into this machine where there's some magic number that spits out at the end, like in um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and it's 41. Um, and there's that sort of a that sort of a process. You, know, you get you get something at the at the end, but we aren't given permission really to see ourselves and our own values sort of in in that space. And there's this incongruence. Like often people struggle with that. So this really is about um, providing the opportunity for people to sit in in a place and and come into relationship with the place that they're making decisions about. Um, so some of the work that we're doing with with Mulawang, for instance, and I've got some of the like some of the team here um, is down at the lake. So it's very lake centric. That's been held off because of COVID, and it's very important, obviously, with this way where it's all relational, that we actually meet in person um, because it's about the way that different knowledges and different values sort of come into relationship with each other, as well as about the relationship and honouring the relationship with that place. So it's really exciting. It's it's a collaboration between the university and the land council as well, so the Aboriginal Land Council. Um, it's so it's experimental in terms of the research around it and looking at how it impacts and informs governance. But really, it's something that's age old and that's that's embedded within country. So um, so this approach. So it's the way that we tend to work in most of our negotiations and I see some of our other stakeholders here, Kerry. Um, so we're really trying to flip that and, and the way that as a community we're engaging with other decision makers um, so that we're adopting this values-based approach, which is rather difficult to articulate, but we're hoping that through the research that we'll actually be able to articulate sort of what exactly that, that means and what that looks like and then the impact in terms of these decisions. Um, but some of the spin-offs even, irrespective of what impact that has on the outcome of a decision-making process. Um, uh, like a, a, signif a significant one for me is just the improved relationship between stakeholders. And if we're sitting in a, in a space and we're all sharing our own perspectives, you know, um, then you get a much more holistic view of an understanding of, of what's before you and the, de the decisions that are going to be made are going to be better for all. So it's as simple as that. I'm a big believer in the wisdom of the crowd. But um, uh, anyway. And that's, yeah, I think that that's a really, that's an incredible way. And it, to think about what we're doing in an arts and humanities space and how that might translate over into governance is one of the really great things about being part of Blue Futures is that, that we, we're, we're all part of that conversation. Governance is not this thing that happens over there. It's this thing that we actually all have a stake in and was all important to us. I'm going to um, just throw to one final question to each of the panellists and we've got about sort of six minutes left um, to be able to do this. So apologies that we're running out of time. But there's a large question that we've been thinking about in, in Blue Futures and this is this question, um, what do you imagine a blue future looks like? And that's the question that, that we want to kind of pose to, to everybody in the, in the room today. So I'm just going to ask each of our panellists to give us a brief answer to that question, what do you imagine a blue future looks like? And I'm going to throw to Joe first. For that oh <laughs> it's a big one that one it's a bit it's you know and it's it's I've been sitting with this and for me I think what does a blue future look like it feels very much as a place for raising awareness it's about storytelling and sharing um, from my practice it's about being able to straddle lots of spaces which the Blue Futures has given a, an amazing opportunity to do and also to speak to Nikki's question around governance for us to have this opportunity to collaborate across all of our streams and to hear from each other. It's a really important part of working towards a Blue Future. So that's been 
a very uplifting and rewarding part of the experience for me personally. Um, yeah, and it's for me, I think too, it's become very much place-based because yeah, it's, it's, it's where I am and it's about what I value and, and those that are around me value as well. So that would, I don't know if that's a straightforward response, but <laughs> that would be how I no, feel about works. that. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. I'm going to throw to Agnieszka now. The, uh, same question. What do you imagine a blue future looks like? It's a kind of a philosophical question, isn't it? You can answer yes. it any way you wish. I think after being involved in this um, project, which I'm very sad it's over, by the way, um, and Blue Futures is serious, ongoing work. That's what it is. And it, for me, I imagine it about forging more partnerships, collaborations and relationships with places, but also diverse communities. So, you know, Aboriginal um, knowledge holders, scientists, um, data model economists, all to do with kind of clarifying the values and principles that we need to protect planets, waters, salty, fresh and bitter. Thank you, Agnieszka. Yeah, I think I think it's an ongoing kind of forging of relationships and doing it together. It's basically what Catherine was saying. Yeah, the power is in the crowd. So yeah, that's how I see Blue Futures. And I think Blue Futures is ongoing, Agnieszka. We, we're all entangled into each other. So I think we're all there forever. Um, I just Freya. thought I have a little whinge about yeah, it. Yeah, no, true. Um, Freya, how would you answer the question? Yeah, look, I, I definitely um, very much agree with um, Joe and Agnieszka and sort of what they've um, conceptualised in terms of what a blue future might look like. Um, I think, you know, going off that and sort of um, thinking about it to me, I think a blue future sort of looks like a place where the ecological stability of the ocean ecosystems is sort of is, is maintained, um, where we can still sort of be going to the beach, enjoying the parts of the ocean that we love and sort of being immersed in that in that water, watery world. And I think sort of going again off sort of Nikki's comment earlier, I think it's sort of about realising that there's sort of a bigger world out there than just our own insular little world that we live in and sort of doing what we can to to make sure that that is that that's protected even with the sort of vast human impacts that we see on an environmental scale and I think it is about sort of recognising those diverse relationships, those diverse interests, um, the diverse perspectives um, and sort of making sure that we do recognise those within the decisions that are made sort of moving forward um, with ocean spaces. Thank you, Fred. Excellent. And Catherine? Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, mine's a much more an emotional response. Um, yeah, when you asked the question, Joshua, I started tearing up. So um, for me, I think the closest I can liken it to is uh, being a mother, right? You know, and like you look at your children or a loved one, you know, like a, a sibling or something along those lines. and and just knowing, it's it's exactly the same, you know. What I wish for them, you know, that they that they are happy and healthy, and what that feels like being in the space. And so, yeah, to know that to be able to stand there and to know that I've done everything that I can to facilitate that, and for all of us, you know, collectively to have that same feeling, this the feeling that we have held and buoyed it the same way that we feel you know, when you're floating. So that feeling. Mm. That's how I know that we've got, that we're in my blue future anyway. Yeah, I think mine's kind of similar. Um, I have been really lucky in the last, uh, however many years I've been swimming um, at, in the Conti and then now into the, into the ocean. And in the last year, which has been horrible, um, and the pool was closed. I was invited by the shark baiters into the into their group and to swim with them. And there are there are people there who are in their seventies. There are people there who are who are um, young, you know, in their in their twenties. There's sometimes they bring their kids along as well. I, my spot on the rock is next to a guy called Cole who tells stories about how he forgets to put his teeth in and then go back goes to Bunnings and tries to tell the guy uh, what he wants. I want to be Cole. And I want there to be so many more coals. I want us to be able to be here and to pass on the stories that have been before coal through coal to me 
into the ocean. I want us to all be in that space and understand that space and respect that space. And I, I don't know, I, I'm leaving it to Michelle to solve the governance issues. <laughs> I'm leaving it to Hugh and Tillman to, to think about industry and I'll get to that in a minute because we'll be talking about that in, in a moment. Um, I, as a writer, all I can do is, is, is try and pass those stories on. And I want to, that's what my blue features is, 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 I want it to be something where I can, those stories can continue and grow and change as we move through. I've got two pieces of business um, to, to move on before I start crying. Um, the first one is, I'm just popping into the chat now. Um, I hope it goes to everybody. Um, a flyer, oops, did it go? No, it did not, try it again. Um, a flyer, which is to ask, to, to, to ask you to answer that question as well. So I'm just trying to talk and do something at the same time, see if I can do that. Um, so there is, a, there is a project that is continuing on in this, um, yeah, I think it's going now, um, as a way of us all being part of that conversation. So that you'll see on the, um, in the chat, there's a flyer which is just inviting you to be part of that conversation as well. It's a very simple survey to tell us something of what you value about a coastal space or a water, watery place. And also to ask for you to answer that question, what do you imagine a blue future looks like? So if you want to be um, continue that conversation, please, um, uh, I, we would all welcome your, your thoughts on this. It's a simple 10 minutes, well, even less survey if you, if you like. My second thing is to remind you of um, next week's seminar, which is our final um, in, in the series of Blue Futures um, seminars. Next week, we're gonna be considering the ways in which the Illawarra and South Coast might better engage with the marine environment and the built, envir built environmental, social, cultural and economic benefits for our coast and communities. And this is about the way in which industry and agribusiness might be able to um, uh, contribute and, and, and um, be involved in this co conversation as well. So we'll be showcasing innovative approaches to improving the environmental sustainability of marine businesses in our region and we'll be considering opportunities for indigenous led and community based approaches to a blue economy. It's gonna be chaired by Hugh Forehead, who is a, a member of, um, of Blue Futures and is also a research fellow at Smart Infrastructure Facility at UIW. Speak speakers include Tillman Burma, who is here today, um, Senior Lecturer of Marketing and Man um, uh, Management and Marketing at the University of Wollongong, uh, Rob Chewings, who is a Jungian uh, Land and Water Aboriginal Corporation member, Ewan McCash, who, is, who runs McCash Oysters and Smart Oysters, and Pia Winberg, um, who is um, uh, the leader of Venus Shell Systems and uh, FICO Health. So really interesting conversations next week about how we will engage with, um, with, the, with the ocean in really sustainable and, and beautiful ways. Um, so I really look forward to seeing you there next week. Um, if you do have a chance to um, do the survey as well, that will be wonderful. But just thanks so much for being here. It's so lovely to see so many people asking questions, putting things in the chat. Just really beautiful um, to see everybody here today. So thank you so much for coming and we'll leave it there. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. thank you, Joshua. Oh, thanks. No worries, Joe. <laughs> Beautiful jo. job. Thank you. Shall we have a little <laughs> chat? Do you want to hang around thank for you, a two-minute chat? Yeah, sure. yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, everybody. Oh, there you are, Hugh. I didn't know Hugh was here. Sorry, Hugh. Hello. Yeah, no, sorry. I, I was a bit late. The, the, oh, that's okay. No worries. I'll just the, let the you link in. didn't work.